and enjoy a conference like this. I have the, the funnest topic out of everybody, but there were some deep subjects. Uh, there's, a, what, I, there's something like 25 messages during the conference, and, and every one of them were deep and all over the Bible and all kinds of information given out. Uh, but the topic that was assigned to me to end the whole thing is, is, was titled, One Minute Before the Rapture. And, uh, and really, there's no verse that says one minute before the rapture, so I can say anything I want. This, this, <laughs> I was really enjoying this. Uh, but, you know, I, you get wondering sometimes, that, does God give little prophetic utterances to someone and you might not realize it? And I got thinking about that, that maybe, and, and you notice Matt Walker put down on the, on the brochure there that uh, this meeting actually was supposed to start at 6.59. Uh, just, just in case that one minute, now actually my speaking time doesn't begin now, but if we are one minute before the rapture, and maybe that's a prophetical utterance that was given, I, I thought to myself, well, I'll just prepare notes like this. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can bluff myself for a minute. <laughs> I'll get through this. Uh, but just in case it's not, <laughs> I have a different set of notes. So take your Bibles and turn to Titus chapter 2. And apparently he didn't give them, the Lord didn't give Pastor Jordan an inkling of prophecy. For those who don't, might not know what the title is, One Minute Before the Rapture, and I just will talk about the rapture, but the rapture is this showing on the chart. There's a time in which God is going to take his people, the believers, out of this world, and then he's going to judge the world because this, this world is on a, on a collision course with its creator because they have rejected him, they have not retained him in their knowledge, they could care less about him, and they even care less that he visited this earth and made a payment for man's sin. And uh, so they're in a collision course, but before God judges the world, those of us who believe in this age of grace we live in, uh, there's something called a rapture, catching away, catching up to be with the Lord. And we'll talk about that. And the idea, one minute before the rapture, is for us to contemplate when will that rapture take place? When could it take place? And, and we'll be thinking about that. So look at Titus chapter 2 and look at verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, God, uh, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that uh, we'll give it some real thought to the fact of one minute before the rapture, because someday it will be one minute before the rapture. So I pray that each one of us will be attentive, give some thought to the things that your Bible says, that it might guide our hearts. And again, Father, we do thank you uh, for those who have a work of faith, a labor of love that we've seen by providing this conference, and now give us some understanding about that patience of hope. In Christ's name we pray, amen. It is in Titus chapter 2, the verses that we read there really do prepare us for the situation that we're describing one minute before the rapture. Uh, in our Bible study, we often use the chart to show that there is a past, there is a present, and then there is a future. And God in the past dealing with the nation of Israel, God presently is dealing with all men of all nations today. And there is a future time in which God is going to judge the world and Jesus Christ will come back and set up the kingdom, restore the heavens and the earth to his authority, and eternity will begin. So we talk about past, present, and future, but if you'll notice what we just read there, in this very age of grace that we're living in, there's a past, there's the present, and there's a future. It started out in verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. It was already active. Then it says, teaching, and that's what is present in the age of grace. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live righteously and, uh, and God, uh, soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 
And then verse 13 is the future, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you have a past, present, and future there. When it says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, you know, you, you, well, that verse is not saying that all men have come to acknowledge the grace of God. But the very fact that men get up in the morning and they do not experience the events that are going to take place when God judges this world, whether they know what they're seeing or not, the grace of God hath appeared unto all men. One of the things that, that we see and know is that the, the, there came a time in which it was time for God to judge the world. And when that time came, God did something that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. He began to dispense His grace. He raised up the Apostle Paul, and that grace is, was afforded because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, and it provided a means for God to be gracious with this world. And so when he says, The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, whether they acknowledge it or not, it is still appearing to all men as we live in this dispensation of grace. Every time you don't see the wrath of God and heavens open like a scroll and, and judgment being poured out from God, it's the dispensation of grace. That in this dispensation of grace, when it says teaching us, now that's the person who came to understand what this grace is about and the salvation that's in Jesus Christ. That that grace teaches us who believe the gospel that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Notice there's a negative first. There's some things to deny, to be separated from. To deny ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So you got two things in the negative there, and you got three things in the positive. But the one that stands in the middle is that word soberly. And, and when you think about the, where it says denying ungodliness and worldly lust, then you come to the word soberly. Soberly has the idea of right, clear, true thinking. Because we have God's word and we got God's plan for the ages, and because we got an understanding of the grace that has appeared to all men and has saved our soul, we can think soberly. We can think right. We can think clear. We can think truth. <laughs> You're not going to find truth anywhere outside that Bible. And, and, and that the way, when you think that way, when it says to think soberly, then it says righteously. Well, righteousness comes out of clear thinking, out of truthful thinking. Righteousness as opposed to the, the negative, the second negative thing that was said in that verse, and that is denying worldly lust. Instead of living by worldly lust, when we think soberly, that thinking process teaches us to live righteously rather than, than uh, by worldly lust. And then live godly rather than ungodliness. And, and godly there, the grace of God teaches us, uh, when we think soberly about that, that it, it, it makes us look at life and focused on God, focused on Him, realizing life centers around Him, and when we take the Bible and think soberly based on the Scriptures, His life lives in us and works through us. So that the present, the, path, the grace of God has appeared to all men, it's teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, then verse 13 says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So looking for looks now looks to the future. And when it says that blessed hope, that blessed hope, you know, you, you, you've heard the, the trio of things that's back in, in several places in the Bible, but it's faith, love, and hope. And faith is what God said. Love is, is first we learn the love of God, and then that, God, that love works in us to, be, to motivate us. But the hope is something God has given us to sustain us through life. When we talk about this blessed hope, we're, we're talking about not something we wish will happen, but we're talking about a sure understanding uh, and appreciation of what is going to happen. And what is going to happen, there's this blessed hope about the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Uh, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to appear. When you take the word hope, now I'm going to make it easy on you. We're just going to talk about some things and uh, not have you turn a lot of verses. We will turn to some verses. But when you talk about the blessed hope, one of the things that you learn about in Romans chapter 8 is that the, the, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. We live in a time of suffering. 
because God hasn't set things right yet. And Jesus Christ hasn't set up his kingdom on this earth. And while we're living in this postponed time, this age of grace, before God judges the world, we're living in a present evil world. And we will suffer living in this world. It talks about the whole creation groaneth and travail in pain till now. And not only so, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we uh, groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body, for we are saved by hope. We're waiting for that redemption of our body when we're physically going to be taken off this earth and that is our hope. That's this blessed hope he's talking about and we escape all the evil and all the corruption and all the suffering that's going on in this world. But until it comes, we live in that patience of hope waiting for that event. And, and the reason it says that hope saves us, it keeps us from despair. We know there's an end to this suffering someday. We know there's a time in which God's going to make everything right. And, and that hope is going to come when the Lord Jesus Christ appears for us. So we're looking for that blessed hope. The, the blessed hope is described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and even chapter 5 when it says, Paul says, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, he's going to come in the air, shall not prevent, go before them that are asleep. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. We call it the rapture because we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is that blessed hope and glorious appearing that this verse is talking about. The next chapter of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 talks about us, about, um, about us putting on the breastplate of love and faith and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the event that we're looking for. And it's called in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, it's called the one hope of our calling. Everybody saved in this age, whether dead or alive, have the same hope. And that hope is to enter into God's eternal purpose for us. His, we have an eternal life and an eternal purpose in the heavens. And that's so we have that, that, that one hope of our calling. That's what he's talking about when he talks about this blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that blessed hope, that certainly focuses on us. We're looking for that blessed hope. But we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. Now that focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is He? The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord Himself is going to descend from heaven, but but who is Jesus Christ? He's God who became a man for the purpose of dying on the cross for our sins that we could be redeemed, our sins could be paid for so that we can be saved from being part of his judgment and cast into a lake of fire for eternity. He came and died for us. That's what grace is all about. It explains what Jesus Christ accomplished on that cross. So he is the great God and at the same time our Savior. God who created mankind, who man has rebelled against, he himself came and died on the cross to be, redeem us from our sins, to give us the gift of eternal life, because salvation is by God's grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. We don't save ourselves. He's the great God and Savior. You're the sinner. You need a Savior. And who that Savior is, it's the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And just, I've already said it, but... What did he do? What did this great God and Savior do for us? Verse 14, who gave himself for us. And if you don't want, when we say gave himself, when the verse says gave himself for us, gave himself to die on the cross for our sins. He took our place. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But it says, who gave himself for us, so we know that he, why he came, why he saved us, or how he saved us, but why did he save us? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. God saved us for an eternal purpose, a purpose to live for him now, 
And the grace of God teaches us denying ungodliness and worldly lust, live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. He saved us from our sin, redeemed us from how much iniquity? All iniquity. When Jesus Christ died on that cross, he paid for every last sin you ever committed or yet will commit. And that way he's paid for them so that you could be saved. And, 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 and by dying on the cross for your sins, redeeming you from your sins, there's nothing left for you to do to be saved except trust what the Bible said he did. And salvation is God's gift to you that's received on the basis of faith. I say that to you just so that you, you know, you come here. I don't know if you've been here the whole time and all these messages and all, but if you're new and, and don't understand that, you realize man has made religion out of God's salvation, made churchianity out of God's salvation, have all kinds of customs and rituals and all kinds of things. But the gospel message is that you're a sinner and God loves you and Jesus Christ is God who became a man, lived an absolutely perfect life so that he could go to the cross and die on the cross to pay for your sins. And then rose from the dead to be your savior. And he's coming back, he ascended back into heaven, he's coming back for those who have trusted in him to take us home to glory before he judges this world who doesn't want any part of him and they will have no part of his eternal life. But salvation is a free gift because Jesus Christ died and paid for it all. And I don't know if you know, you go to church sometimes all your life and never hear that salvation's a free gift, that when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God saves you. And you know that because that's what his verses say. So this, this prepares us to, to start thinking about uh, this subject, to be able to, to think soberly about one minute before that rapture. You know, when you think one minute before the rapture, you have to ask yourself, where will you be? what will you be doing? Now, if it's a long time off, maybe we'll be in the grave and waiting for the dead to rise first. But if it's not that long away, and it's going to happen maybe in our lifetime, then what will you be doing? Where will you be? What if in, in your area that the Lord Jesus Christ appears 1101 on a Sunday at morning? Where will you be? Now, I'm a pastor of a church. I get to ask that question. I ask that question every Sunday when I see empty seats and wonder where the saints are at. <laughs> so, you don't have to go to church to be saved, but you go to church to learn things like this to start thinking about that. But where will you be, 1101, if the Lord comes at that time? So you, you think about things like that. By the way, I want to share something to you before I ask you more questions to be sober about. And that is in this Titus verse when we're talking about the, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. That, that there's two things to under, know about that. And that is when it says looking for that blessed hope, it's been clear and made known that we're not looking for Israel to become a nation be recognized as a nation, or we're not waiting for Jerusalem to be recognized as the capital. <laughs> we're, we're not looking for Israel to return to the land. We're not looking for them to rebuild their temple. We're not waiting for wars and earthquakes to increase. We're not waiting for the beginning of sorrows to take place or the abomination of desolation. We're not even waiting for the sign of His coming because that's the Lord before he comes back to earth, there's going to be a sign of his coming before he returns. We're not looking for any of that. We're looking for him himself to appear. And the reason we don't look for all those things in this age of grace, we're not looking for the signs of the time because we don't live in the times of the signs. Signs were back here concerning the Lord Jesus Christ's first coming and his second coming. But we live in this dispensation of grace, and we don't live in the time of signs. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the other thing I wanted you to know is that special phrase. We're looking for that glorious, uh, the, the, we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Glorious appearing. Uh, hold your place. Well, no, you don't need to hold your place there. Come over with me to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 1. Paul is the only one that talks about appearing. Everybody else talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, him re being revealed and coming back to earth. But we're looking for this glorious appearing, and, and that's unique to the Apostle Paul, and it began that way. When the Apostle Paul is talking about us and God's purpose for us in his grace, um, he, he says over in verse 10, um, I went to first, 2 Timothy, verse 10. He says, but now is made manifest, this God's purpose for us in grace, but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle. That appearing Paul's talking about there, God's purpose for us in grace, appeared when Jesus Christ appeared to Saul of Tarsus, who was an enemy of Jesus Christ, he appeared to him on the road to Damascus and called him and made him the minister, the, the apostle to the Gentiles and revealed to him about this age of grace. It began with an appearing of Jesus Christ. When that verse in Titus says glorious appearing, that appearing, the reason it says glorious, appearing has to do with the brightness, this glory. And you know the Bible tells us that when Paul, when he saw this light, other people saw the light, but they didn't hear what was being revealed to Paul, what was going on there. They knew nothing about what was going on there. There was just this brilliant light, and then the Lord began to speak to the Apostle Paul. Even, interesting, he says twice, well, Luke says it, and Paul says it, uh, that it took, day, it took place at, at noon, at midday, one place it says. So that here at midday this glorious light shines on the Apostle Paul this appearing and this revelation of grace appeared to him and we're looking now for this blessed hope and glorious appearing that's going to end this age of grace and you know when you start thinking about the Bible and how unique it's written you start wondering you know when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back here he comes back as a thief in the night are we waiting for the Lord to come at night or are we waiting for some day and could it be at noonday and, uh, but somewhere in the world it would be noonday. But, but anyhow, the point is, is Paul talks about that appearing there. And e even at the end of his life, he says uh, that he's fought a good fight, he kept the faith. Uh, henceforth, there's laid up for him a crown of righteousness, not only to him, but to all those who love his appearing. So we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing. And, and the point of that is to think soberly about that, is to start thinking, where will you be? What will you be doing? You know, I, I say this because it, it has hit me. I, in, you know, when you pastor a long time, things happen. And even believers can get overcome by some of the pressures and difficulties of life and even commit suicide. Jesus Christ died for all iniquity. You know, religion will tell you you're going right to hell. But that's murder, and Jesus Christ died for murderers. And even if it's self-murder... The Lord Jesus Christ paid for their sins. But I'm asking the question, thinking about one minute before the rapture, do you realize someone is going to give up on God's strength and hope and take their own life one minute before the rapture? They kill themselves, they're absent from the body, present with the Lord, and the Lord says, wait, come back, we're going to <laughs> the rapture. But what a shame. What a... <laughs> Something like that to give up when it was maybe the rapture was just one minute away. But, there, but there's other things. Just think, someone, and perhaps you, one minute before the rapture will be telling a lost person about God's love for them and Christ's payment on the cross for their sins. And if they would just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he would save them and give them eternal life. And the rapture takes place. That's the way to go home, isn't it? Then think about the person you just said it to. If in that split moment they believed in their heart under righteousness, God saved them and gave them eternal life a second before the rapture. Wow, praise the Lord. They don't even get to know what the Christian life down here is all about. They get saved and instantly in heaven. But how about the one you just gave the gospel to? And the rapture takes place and the guy said, I'll hear you another time the tragedy that he's going to go into that tribulation and face the wrath of God and the strong delusion that's going to come into this world for those who didn't love the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But that makes us stop and think, doesn't it, about one minute before the rapture. Now, now one of the other things that we need to think about then is 
Could it be one minute from now? Could it be? Now, I know believers that say, oh, no, it couldn't be. Come to with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I'm not going to teach the passage. I just want to show you. There, there are some people, and by the way, down in verse 25, when we live in this age of grace that was a mystery, it says in Romans 11:25, I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. A lot of people teach that that's a reference to the very last person who gets saved into the body of Christ. As soon as that last person gets in, the age of grace is over. But that's not what it, the fullness of the Gentiles means. Over when he was talking about the nation of Israel in verse 11, he says, I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, so, uh, salvation is come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? That is, God has a program for the nation of Israel to bring a kingdom here on this earth. Their fullness is when Jesus Christ comes in and they're part of that kingdom. It's the fullness of what God promised them. The fullness of the Gentiles is the rapture when we go to be with the Lord. Not the number of people in the body of Christ, but we enter into our fullness. And then after that, God goes back, as the next verse says, all Israel shall be saved. I threw that out because I even thought earlier that uh, I should when we say, could the rapture be in the next minute, that, that some people think that's what they're looking for, that last person to get saved. But other people look back over in verse 19. Where Paul says, now remember, Paul's writing to the Gentiles. Sometimes we think he, he's only addressing believers, but he says in verse 13, I speak unto you Gentiles. And that's, that's the general group, not, not just you believers. Paul's got a message to the Gentiles. And it says in verse 19, Thou will say then that the branches, Israel, a certain part of Israel, Thou will say then that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Now, when the branches that were broken off when God was dealing with Israel is unbelieving Israel. The believing Israel didn't get broke off. But so I say that to you so you realize he's just talking about Gentiles in general. Uh, Be not high minded, but fear, it says in verse, at the end of verse 20. Fear what? For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest also he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them that fell, the nation of Israel, uh, severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Who did he cut off of Israel? Unbelievers. Who's going to get cut off? Gentiles who are not going to believe this message of grace. It's going to come to an end and they're going to be cut off the opportunity of being saved in this age of grace, of being, a re, of being part of the source of life, Jesus Christ, the root. And uh, so there is coming a time, and some people look at that verse of scripture and I do see, oh, look at the, the warning there that just like that program, Israel got cut off, there's going to be a time, there's going to be a cutting off of this program and the lost, the lost are going to be cut off. God's going to end his dealing with the Gentiles and then start pouring out his wrath. So when some people read that, then I've heard people say the rapture couldn't be near because the, the world's got to get to a place where there's no one willing to believe the gospel. And, and so the, since there's still people willing to believe the gospel, the rapture cannot be one minute from today. time Paul went back to Jerusalem, James said, look how many thousands of Jews there are that believe and they're zealous of the law. People, individual Jews in Israel got saved after God cut them off from a nation and changed the program. When this age of grace is over and that tribulation begins, Revelation chapter 7 talks about the multitudes that are going to be saved during the tribulation. You lost your mic. You lost my mic. You're lucky I don't move around. But I, 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 I am using the chart here. So, the, um, In the tribulation, when this age is over, 
there's multitudes that are going to get saved in the first part of that tribulation. So people were still willing to believe. So it, when you look at this, that, that's, there is a warning of, to the Gentiles about not being high-minded. That there is coming a time God's going to cut them off. But it, you can't identify that time as no one in the world willing to believe the message again, uh, any, anymore. But there is coming a time in which God is going to look at the attitude of this world and say they don't deserve my grace anymore. He's going to withdraw his grace and pour out his wrath. But we don't know when that is going to be. The question I really have is not so much could it be one minute from now? My question is always has, why hasn't it been one minute, one day, one year ago? Because when you look at the condition of this world and their attitude toward God, you wonder why God has not already withdrawn his grace and poured out his wrath. Especially if you've experienced some of the sufferings of this world and the evil that's in this world. But even in the religious world, the attitude about what we're talking about, God has a program for Israel and a program for Gentiles today and what God's purpose is for the heavens and the earth. The, the average church person objects highly to dispensational truth. And that's what we're talking about, God dispensing different programs for an eternal purpose that he has. And, and, and so there is this, there, there's this attitude among the church, the religious people, uh, of hatred toward dispensational truth. There is the, the preterism uh, of just spiritualizing the Bible, not taking God's word as being true. And then the perversion of the gospel, where the greatest gift, the greatest thing that ever happened in this world is Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross for our sins and paying for all our sins and people not recognizing the grace of God and the gift of God that's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and turning it into aisle walking and church membership and, and baptisms and everything else denying the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You wonder why God hasn't already ended the age of grace. Churches people today heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears where they're going to church to listen to a preacher to tell them everything God's doing for them not learning about what God has done for us and what we can do for him in service but everything centers around self and how God's going to do this for you and that for you and, and, and the whole religious world thinking that way you wonder why God hasn't already withdrawn his grace now Peter tells us Paul tells us that God's not willing that any should perish but come to repentance. That, and the term for that, by Paul says it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, and Peter says it in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 15, that God is long-suffering. Peter says, not willing that any should perish. That's why even more people got saved after God cut off the nation of Israel. Peter understood that. And Paul understands that that's what's been going on for 2,000 years, God has been long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. So we have an understanding of that. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're teaching this passage, or we're past this. We had taught it. And the very things that we're thinking of, I had already given a lot of thought to when I taught through this passage, so I was glad to receive this assignment. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians Actually, in chapter 6 and verse 19, the Corinthians were carnal. They weren't thinking soberly. They weren't thinking according to God's word. They were living their life for themselves, carnally, in the flesh, as, like lost people. But they were saved because they did trust the gospel when Paul came there and preached the gospel. So, so in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, he says in verse 19, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? When you got saved, God sealed you by putting you, the Holy Spirit in you. That Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? Therefore glorify God, for, no, <laughs> for, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Paul's calling on the Corinthians, hey, think about what life's really all about. And, and quit living for self. And, and realize that God saved you, put his Holy Spirit in you. You belong to him. You're bought with a price. Jesus Christ redeemed us from all iniquity. We belong to him now. And now glorify him in your body and in your spirit. Make that decision to, to make life count for him. 
So Paul's challenging the Corinthians that way, getting them out of their carnality. Now in chapter 7, he deals with the marital situation and, and all the different situations the, the Corinthians were going through. And Paul's dealing with how they should handle, how so they should serve the Lord in the marital status and social, ser and social things, in economics, even religion. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so he says in verse 24 of chapter 7, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So you've been called to the gospel, you've believed the gospel, and now once you've called, you've been, the idea of calling is for service. You've been saved to serve, and now whatever the situation is, serve the Lord. That, that's, I read that for that reason. He, he does say over there in uh, verse 26, uh, talking about virgins, he says, I suppose, therefore, that it is good for the present distress, I say, that it is good for a man so to be. The present distress, I think Paul's dealing with at Corinth, is the fact that they're living carnally. Carnal, carnally. They're living in the flesh. They, they, don't, they haven't grown spiritually. And I would warn anybody contemplating marriage, don't get married when you're living after the flesh and walking in the flesh. Uh, do, you get married at a time where you can make a spiritual decision about a mate in life. So I believe that's what Paul's talking about there. But what I want you to see is he breaks out and says something else in verse 29. Watch these verses. But this I say, brethren, that time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none, and they that weep as though they weep not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they buy not, and they that use this world is not abusing it. Why? For the fashion of this world path us away. Now, you know, in that verse, Paul says time is short. Then he talks about it remaineth. So in the time remaining, he tells you some things that you ought to do in serving the Lord. And then he says, for the fashion of this world passes away. It's going to end. But when he makes that statement about time is short, that the Apostle Paul he was given a revelation that God interrupted. The world came to a place where they rejected God and it was time for wrath to be poured out. And instead of wrath being poured out, God poured out his grace and dispensed grace. When God revealed that to the Apostle Paul, one thing God never revealed to the Apostle Paul is how long he had to go out and tell people about this grace and this salvation. And Paul went out with an eagerness there. As I consider this passage of Scripture, there's two things. Paul, after being saved, could never imagine someone not living their life for the Lord with all they had, with all their breath, with all their heart, with all their soul. You, you, you see that in Paul's life. And he, he can't imagine believers not living that way for the Lord. The other thing is, is that Paul knew that when this dispensation began... That this is not a prophesied time. Everything God did with Israel, God gave a schedule, a time schedule. God never gave a time schedule for the age of grace. He realized that this is a dispensation of grace, that we're living on borrowed time, unprophesied time, a time that was never revealed before. That's why it's called a mystery. And so God never revealed to him how long we have. So there's an urgency as the Apostle Paul goes out with this message of grace to give it out. So when he says time is short, and he says it remaineth, he, he, when it says it remaineth that they which have wives be as though they have none, you married men get busy serving the Lord, your wife's your help meet there at the house. And, and then it says, uh, uh, and they that weep as though they weep not. He talks about widows in this passage. Okay, you, you lost a loved one, but you're still here. Get busy serving the Lord. And they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. He's talking about some people getting married. <laughs> That's a real rejoicing time. But don't just keep rejoicing about the marriage. Okay, you got married, enjoyed the day, had the honeymoon. Now get busy for the Lord. They that buy as though they buy not. That's the first thing you do after you get married. You go out and try to buy a house or at least have to rent an apartment. But okay, take care of that business. Get busy for the Lord. And they that use the world is not abusing it. That's the business people that get active in the world. Remember, the fashion of this world passes away. So Paul is challenging people, and when he looks at the time we have in the age of grace, he's looking at it in a very special way. He says, time is short. Come over to Romans chapter 13. That's the book before.
Romans chapter 13. You're supposed to know what time it is because verse 11 says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is your salvation nearer than when you believed. And that's true. I don't know when you got saved, if it was a long time ago or if it was a short time ago, but time has moved on. And your salvation, your deliverance from this world, you're saved from the penalty of sin when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're saved from the power of sin as grace works in you. But you're going to be saved from the presence of sin at that rapture. And Paul says, now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. We're looking for a daytime. Let, uh, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not rioting, nor drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife or envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. God has saved you. He saved you apart from works. He saved you by trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ, but he saved you to serve him. He saved you to make you a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You'll serve, you have the opportunity in this life and the life after to serve him. So Paul's challenging you here, and again, he, he, there's that emphasis of time being short. Over in Philippians, he, when he writes Philippians, he tells them, Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Ephesians tells you to redeem the time because the days are evil. Time is of the essence. And, and you don't know how long you have. The book of James talks about life. And he, he makes this statement. And I don't think Paul's referring to this about time being short. But he says, uh, wherefore uh, we know uh, not what shall be the, on the morrow. For what is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. Time is short. Even your lifetime is short. And you're nearer than salvation than when you first believed. But Paul he goes out and serves the Lord with an urgency, realizing we live on borrowed time. Come over with me to Romans chapter five, uh, 9. No, make it Romans chapter 11. It is 9. Now, again, I'm not teaching this passage, but look at what this, thing, this passage says. Now, Isaiah's here is Isaiah of the Old Testament. And, he, and Paul's quoting him. And, and he says, Isaiah, Isaiah say, also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he, God, will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. You know, I don't know about you, but when you think about eternal God and about time, how much time do we have? Well, when he says a short work upon the earth, he's talking about Israel's program. And in talking about Israel's program, let me first give you a little outline of the Bible. Way back from Adam and Eve all the way until Abraham. Where's you got Abraham here? From the beginning of creation to Abraham, God was dealing, it was the multiplication of the nations. And from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, what you have there is the rise and the fall of the nations. Nations means Gentiles, but it's the rise. They were multiplied, man multiplied, and then they all turned from God. We've learned about that. Romans 1 talks about that, but you see that in the Tower of Babel. They're worshiping the stars rather than the creator. So Genesis 1 through 11 is the rise and fall of the nations. You know how long of a period of time that is? 2,000 years. You young people, you'll, especially the ones who like math, read Genesis chapter 5 and calculate everybody's life all the way until you get to Abraham. My calculations, it's 2,008 years before Abraham is born, or at least 75 years old. So there's a there's 2,000 year period of time there. But then 
God raises up Abraham, makes a promise to him because through the nation of Israel, God's going to bring salvation to this earth and Jesus Christ reign upon this earth. And God begins to deal with the nation of Israel until Acts chapter 7, there is a fall of the nation of Israel. You read that in Romans chapter 11 about the fall of Israel and the casting away of Israel. And, and that happened in Acts chapter 7 when Stephen says, As your fathers do, so do ye. You always resist the Holy Ghost. They rejected God the Father in the Old Testament through the prophets. They rejected God's Son when he came and they crucified him, said, We'll have no king but Caesar. And then the Holy Spirit came and they rejected the ministry of the Twelve Apostles. The Holy Spirit in that ministry of the Twelve Apostles. They are warned about blaspheming the Holy Ghost and they did it and the nation of Israel fell. So from Abraham to Acts chapter 7 is the rise and fall of the nation. The nation of Israel. The hope for the world. You know how long that was? 2,000 years. Now that's interesting because that's when I say that when Israel fell, it was time for wrath. If you realize 2,000 years took place and the nations rejected God, so he cut them off, raised up the nation of Israel be, to be a light to the world, and they rejected their program and God cut them off. Now you got Jew and Gentile all under sin. And it's time now just to judge the world, destroy the sinners, and take the believing remnant and set up the kingdom. But instead... God saved Saul of Tarsus, made him Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles, and began to save people in this dispensation of grace for a secret purpose he has for us in the heavens. You know how long it's been that God has been dispensing grace in this world? Almost 2,000 years. Now we've learned some things this week about principles. I, I, I was funny watching all the different people have two-day principle and, and uh, uh, oh, well, I forget all the been a week long. <laughs> Anyhow, it's not a principle, but there is something that's just worth thinking about. It's already been shared, but it was shared a different way, and I'm not going to take you through the verses, but I want you to maybe to write some things down because now you can go home and do some personal study about some things. And, the, and that is, if you, if, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 9 through 11, you learn that Israel was given the Sabbath day. Six days they're going to work, the seventh day they rest. So there's a seven day that Israel was to follow. But then in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5 and 15 and 16, that every year they would take Passover, and then after Passover they would have to count seven weeks. And after seven weeks, seven weeks is 49, and then the next day after that is 50th, that's Pentecost, and they would celebrate Pentecost. Also, so there's seven days and there's seven weeks, but also in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 20, uh, 23 and 24, is on the seventh month of every year was that great day of the blowing of the trumpets and the great day of atonement and the, and the Feast of Tabernacles that Israel was to celebrate as their third uh, feast day of the year that they would celebrate and come before the Lord. So there's seven days, there's seven weeks, and then there's seven months. But also in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 4, Israel had to count seven, six years, and on the seventh year, let their land rest for one year. So there's a seven-year time that Israel would count and let their land rest. Also in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 through 11, Israel was not only look at that seventh year, but they were also to go every seven times seven years, and then the year after that, the 50th year, is called the year of Jubilee, where all debts were forgiven, everybody. Well, they got a lot of sevens going here. Then God gave a revelation to Daniel about how long Israel had on their time schedule until Jesus Christ comes and sets up his kingdom and is anoint the most holy and brings prophecy to a conclusion. And Daniel's prophecy is based on 70 times 7 weeks, but weeks of years. 490 years, and then all of Israel's time schedule was going to be fulfilled and would have been fulfilled if God didn't interrupt the program with the age of grace. They were on a time schedule. And there's that 70 times 7 years fulfilling uh, that prophecy. I say that to you when you think about this verse here, and Isaiah says, a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. He didn't know about the age of grace. The short work the Lord would have made upon the earth 
after this judgment time come, this is only seven years long, there was only like going to be 4,000 years and God's purpose and prophecy would have ended. God wasn't going to make a long use of this earth. For, to me, for an eternal God to, to accomplish his, what he wants to do in, in the earth through prophecy for, in 4,000 years, I'm thinking, well, man, he, he's eternal. Why would he do it so fast? And then to think, oh, he stretched it. How long is he going to stretch it? We don't know, but it's almost 2,000 years, and there's that seven-year principle, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000. Jesus Christ comes back, and he'll reign 1,000 years before eternity begins. Two, four, six, 1,000 years. Eternity, you know what the number eight is in your Bible? The number of new beginnings, new heaven, new earth. Now, I'm not saying that this age of grace is going to last 2,000 years. What I'm saying is, what person in their right mind would not understand that the rapture could take place at any moment? Why would they think you got all kinds of time when even in prophecy God was going to cut it short and Paul in the dispensation of grace says time is short? It's contrary to what the Bible would teach. Now, I'm not saying, someone said, don't say it's next Tuesday, and someone else thought, said it's going to be Friday or Saturday or something like that. I'm not saying when it's going to happen, uh, but if you call my son, he'll tell you when it's going to happen. He knows the year. He knows the month. He just don't know the day or the hour. And he's got the whole family scared to death. <laughs> my grandson... His nephew, my grandson, Billy, my daughter, oh, no, he's not going to grow up. <laughs> because I showed him these things, and he starts calculating his mind. He's a math person, you know. And he starts calculating, it's got to be. It's gotta. And I'm trying to settle him down, settle down. But at least he's living as, well, no, actually, he's not living one minute. He's got a couple years yet before he thinks the rapture is going to take place. Uh, but I'm not setting the time. But, you know, you can, what we just studied, you realize you, we're living on borrowed time and we're at the end of that time. No matter right. how long the Lord will be gracious, he could blow our mind and wait another thousand years because it didn't, nothing says this is 2,000 years. But it's ridiculous to think you've got much time. Right. So what you're going to do for the Lord, you need to do it while you can. You need to get busy, not live like the Corinthians that were living carnally for the flesh. Paul's warning them what to live for. And, and, and as one person has written, we should always be doing what we would want to be doing when the rapture takes place. That's a good thought. But I'd like to close with another thought. Come back to, to Titus chapter 2. We started in Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 again. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. We're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Instead of asking you or uh, asking you to think about one minute before the rapture, I'd like to close by asking you to think about one minute after the rapture. The rapture takes place, and the glorious, uh, the, the, that glorious appearing has taken place, the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, who gave himself for us. Do you think there'll be, well, certainly there's going to be great joy to be called into, into heaven, into our heavenly service. Do you think there might be in that minute after the rapture some thoughts of regret? When you see the one who died for you and what did you do with the life that he gave you? Squander it for yourself? Live for yourself? People left behind that you never gave the gospel to, that you should have gave the gospel to? 
You think that might hit your mind at that last minute? Paul, when he talked to the Philippians, he said unto them, To hold forth the word of life, that I might rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. But if they don't hold forth the word of life, will Paul be rejoicing for them at the judgment seat of Christ or at the rapture? See, I'm thinking there could be a time that you... that there could be a reflection there. And if not there, then it needs to be now. One minute after the rapture, when you see the great God and your Savior and see what he did for you, you're going to have to think, what did I do for him? What did I live for? What did I do with the life he gave me? You know, last year when you left the conference, you probably had all kinds of things you were going to do. Don't wait because you might not have got it done. Perhaps in this conference you're thinking, I'm going home, I'm going to get busy serving the Lord. Well then, don't wait. Time is short. And if there's someone here that's never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, you might say this all sounds really strange, but this Bible's a very unique book. I just threw out those little things about about those years of time, whether that's how God's got it laid out, I don't know, but it's interesting, all the details in the Bible, how everything fits together, all the prophecies that's been fulfilled, and the ones that are yet to be fulfilled, you're playing a game. If you don't realize, this Bible is God's word, and the very essence of this word is that this great God and Savior loves you, and Jesus Christ died on the cross to redeem you from all iniquity, and don't wait to trust him as your Savior. Receive his love. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from not being a part of the eternal kingdom in the heavens and lost in the lake of fire for all eternity. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for a very good week. We do thank you for your love and grace, and I pray that there's been a, a, an awareness every day of all the preaching about this unique age in which we're living in today, but your whole plan for all the ages. You're a God who created us for a purpose, and it's an eternal purpose. You saved us so that we could be a part of that, and that we could be a peculiar people even now, zealous of good works, and to serve you throughout all eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. Thank you for the things that we've learned, and try our hearts. Help us to be willing to deny ourself and allow you to live in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.